Hello there guys, it's me Unstable Voltage. Welcome to episode 3 of Hearts of Iron 4, where I still have no idea what I'm doing. That, that generally doesn't stop me playing other Paradox games. So at the moment we're just trying to get our infrastructure together. We are using the time to decide which technologies we want, what national focuses we're going to take. One thing that's worth remembering in this game is the research trees and national focus trees are quite extensive. And when you compare this to a game like... Um, EU4 which takes place over a period of about 400 years or if you compare it to something like Crusader Kings 2 where um, if you've got all of the expansion packs it takes place over about um, six or seven hundred years this game only takes place over the period of about I think 20 years something like that so you do have a, a very limited amount of time to get everything researched now there's quite a lot of tech when you actually think about it if I just click on a tech here, I mean, some of these tech trees don't look that huge, but when you consider that there are, let's go back up there, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So you've got 11 different tabs here. Uh, and as well as naval and air tabs to build new planes and ships, uh, there's also naval and air doctrine that allows us to basically do different things. So if we go ahead, for example, and look at the air doctrine here, so, I don't... Are these mutually exclusive? Yep, so you pick one or the other. So, we've got strategic destruction. By bombing the enemy's factories, either by night or more dangerously during the day, we can seriously hinder their war machine. So, this allows us to concentrate on building our aircraft or our air support to enemy divisions with optimal support. So, this is basically allowing us to use our aircraft to help our troops on the ground by taking out enemy forces, which I think is mainly... Uh, what Great Britain did during the war. I know they did do some strategic bombing. And then there's tactical bombers are flexible and can perform both ground support and regular bombing. But they probably won't be as good. So this is more of a combination of both of these lines, but not as good as either one of them individually, which is probably more what Britain were doing. So if we looked at these, for example, this one would give us plus 10% fighter detection. So we are better at finding where their aircraft are this one would give us plus 15 percent fighter detection and this one would give us plus 20 percent interception detection and then of course some of the things down these lines are mutually exclusive you've got pretty much the same thing going on down here for the um fleets as well as you can see, we've already got one for the fleet. The fleet in being a strong fleet focused around battleships means that we are a force to be reckoned with when deployed at sea. Or we've got trade interdiction, which is against a stronger naval opponent. We can focus on tying up their fleet and destroying supply lines to starve their war machine. So that's focused on not necessarily winning big naval battles, but just doing sort of hit and run and damaging their supplies. Or there's base strike, which is focused on carriers and their support. So that one is not so much to win naval encounters, but to just basically get rid of their aircraft carriers. But we are going down um, this one of having a really powerful fleet. The reason I've just paused the game is because I noticed a new pop-up here. And that's Republican Spain is asking for military access. I'm going to say yes. I don't really see any reason to say no. Um, I think what's going on down in Spain isn't really my problem right now you can see that there are several battles going on we don't have any intel in this combat so we can't actually um tell what's going on over there but uh, i guess we'll find out sooner or later the world tension is going up it's currently on five percent at the moment and uh, we can go and have a look at what has increased that world tension so um germany uh, militarizing the rhineland caused 1.7 percent of the world tension Nationalist Spain declaring war on Spain caused 0 0.3. Uh, German Reich sent two volunteer divisions to nationalist Spain. So the Germans are actually getting involved in that war. The Soviet Union sent three volunteer divisions to Republican Spain, which is good because that means that Germany and the Soviet Union are likely to end up on opposite sides. It's always nice when that happens. Nobody wants a super Germany-Soviet alliance. And Japan sent two volunteer divisions to nationalist Spain. So Japan are on the same side as Germany, which you would expect. So it, we should be supporting the Republicans, if anything else. I wonder if it's worth trying to see if we can do that. So this is Republican Spain. So I could possibly send volunteers. Your country is not allowed to send volunteer forces. We need world tension at least 50%. So we're not allowed to get involved with any of that. 
That's a little bit of a shame. But at the same time, it's probably a good reason. Modify government. So now we have over 150 political power. So what we could do now is hire somebody to help with some of this stuff. Um, what about if we added a... What's the material design and what does that do? So reduce small arms research time. So these, these reduce research. Okay. Industrial concern. Right. So all of these just reduce research time now then. Chief of Army, Chief of Navy, Air Force, High Command, Military High Command. So what does a Chief of Army do? Division attack. Right, so these, in these basically boost your military strength. So we need a political advisor then more than anything, I think. Theorist is going to be sort of, yeah, doctrines and stuff. So, let's go for the uh, war industrialist. And that should then really speed up our production in our factories now. So we still have a production efficiency cap. Now, what is it that he actually does? He just gives you 10% production speed. And we do now have uh, another factory. So these, some of these factories are completing. We'll, again, keep stacking the free factories in on infantry equipment. Um, again, that does upset the efficiency a tiny little bit. It dropped down from 55% to 51.7, but it's climbing back up. Support equipment is doing well now. It's actually We only need 54. How are those new divisions doing? There we go. We can see that uh, one of our infantry divisions here is now 15% equipped. And we finished the research on construction, which is brilliant. So that construction research now means our construction speed is plus 10%. Now, it doesn't say if that's uh, construction speed on everything. I assume it is, because it doesn't say civilian construction speed, it just says construction speed. So we could re uh, resource gain efficiency plus 10%. Uh, we can't, do well we could do that one, but it's ahead of time. So what about these things here in industry? So again, these are both mutually exclusive. Concentrated industry one. Yep, so it's one or the other. So this one gives us plus 20% factory output. And means we can have 20% more factories in a state. Or this one gives us 10% more factory output. But we retain 10% more proficiency um, retention. Factory bomb vulnerability minus 10% and maximum factories in a state. So we still get more factories in a state. We get slightly less factory output with this one. But it does maintain more efficiency. So basically then... Going down this left-hand tree basically means we get more factories and each factory outputs more and more. If we go down this tree, it means our factories don't output quite as much, but there's less penalty for adding factories to, um, uh, to production lines and moving things around. And they're also more resistant to being bombed, which is going to be very, very good for us playing as the United Kingdom. So I think we're going to go for dispersed industry. So let's go ahead and work on that one. And we have a free dockyard, which we could be working on all sorts of stuff with. Uh, but let's work on some destroyers, because apparently you can never have too many of those. We've got a lot of naval dockyards. Let's get them all working on destroyers. There we go. Our manpower is still in the toilet. So we've got 12k free manpower. Most of it is being used by our army, but our navy is using a significant portion of it as well. Uh, so total manpower, uh, that must be our total manpower used, which is like 49k, 0.9% of eligible core population available. Volunteer only 1.5%. I think it will go up, especially, I think as world tension goes up. Now world tension does burn away, you can see it is ticking down slowly. Monthly growth in states, recruitable, 633. Civilian, 1,500 and, yeah, 151,000. Um, civilian recruits because obviously just like in the real war we did have our reserve armies but then when the war happened a lot of people just civilians got called to arms so these guys are still taking attrition though we are actually gaining some experience so what we could do now is we could go in and uh, where's the designer it's under here isn't it so what we could do is go into a division designer 
and it would tell us how much it would cost to save. So what we could do, for example, is we could go and add artillery support. Now that would cost us 10 just to do that. And we still haven't even added any artillery to it. So we can't even afford to add artillery. So we could start adding artillery to some of our infantry divisions. Now then, if we were to do that, why does that make it cheaper to build? Divisions using this template cannot be parachuted. Well, that's just a shame. So, units with this template will receive equipment last and lowest priority once deployed. Perfect for units set to guard bases and such. Units with this template will receive equipment before anyone else and deployed at the highest priority. Used for your best men and where they can do the most good. Okay, so it's nothing to do with their sort of rank or experience or power. It's just to determine whether or not they should get priority on equipment. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. We've finished the Encourage Colonial Elite. Let's go and clear that out now. We don't need to worry about that at the moment. We would like to get some more experience so we can do something useful with it. So we've now worked down into this one, which reduces our research time. So we can fortify East Asia, which will give us a civilian factory and a naval dockyard in Singapore, Hong Kong. Or Commonwealth Ties, which will give us democratic leanings, opinion of with Canada, um, British Raj, New Zealand, South Africa. Now, what does that lead into? Develop with South Africa. South Africa gains industrial development. That could be useful. So a lot of these is to help to buff our overseas um, friends, which might be nice. Um, home defense might be useful as well. Gain base national unity plus 10%. I think we're going to go down the home defense tree a little bit as well. Uh, just to try and um, get rid of this national unity penalty that we've got for having um, Edward VIII sort of crashing the party right now. It would be nice if we could recruit some more troops. But we're still struggling to get all of our um, reinforcements done. So upgrade requests... Didn't even realize we were upgrading anything. So set priority for equipment going to upgrade active troops compared to deployment queue and reinforcements. So what are we actually upgrading? So this colonial garrison then, I'm assuming that this is just a... Um... Right, so a colonial garrison is basically a smaller group of infantry that doesn't have any engineers with it. So it's basically six. Now this is a division, so I guess these are individual regiments. So a colonial garrison is six infantry regiments. And an infantry division is nine infantry regiments currently with an engineering company. So maybe these are companies. I always get so confused with these. And especially... Um, because it's different between the United Kingdom and the way America does it. But I mean, you have... You have squads, you have companies, you have platoons, you have regiments, you have divisions. You know, it's it, it, what there's a program that I absolutely love. If you guys are interested in in the war and World War Two, most of you have probably seen it. HBO did a brilliant series a few years back called Band of Brothers, and it is all based on um, the the real events of Easy Company, who were part of the 101st Airborne. And I, I can never get it right because the, the, there's the divisions and there's the companies. But they're, they're easy company. Um, there was a lot of men in, in the 101st Airborne, hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, and the series does follow multiple uh, companies uh, within that division. But it's an absolutely brilliant series. Um, at the time when it first came out, most of the actors in it were relatively unknown. There's a few people in it who are sort of relatively famous, like David Schwimmer's in there, and um, uh, who else at the time? There's, there's just a few people that you, you would have noticed back then when it first aired. Um, but you look at it now, and there's so many people in there. The last time I watched it, just a couple of months ago, people that I didn't even spot the first time around. Michael Fassbender's in it, um, James McAvoy's in it, Tom Hanks' own son's in there as well. Um... You've got uh, Damian Lewis. There's just so many sort of stars that are in that show. But at the time, because I didn't really know who any of these people were, because they weren't all that famous, 
you didn't really just pick them out. I mean, you did with David Swimmer. You looked at him and you just think, well, he he's not um, he's not Captain Silbel. He's just he's Ross. Uh, but you started to see um, other people, and you really did sort of get attached to the characters. So if you love World War Two uh, and you love sort of war stories, and I would highly recommend it. It's a ten part series, so it's like ten hours long. Absolutely fantastic, Band of Brothers. There is a and it's it's made by. Um, uh, basically, Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg. So it's kind of in the same style as Saving Private Ryan. But whereas Saving Private Ryan is a mostly fictional story, Band of Brothers is more true to life. They did another one a few years later as well, HBO, called The Pacific, which obviously is based on the American campaign uh, against the Japanese. Um, in my opinion, not quite as strong a story. And the reason for that is because it's actually a combination of three different stories written by three different um, soldiers during the war and they've kind of sort of mashed them all together so as a series it's constantly jumping around from sort of one theatre to the next uh, but Manda Brothers definitely is absolutely brilliant and I highly highly recommend it I love its pieces so what have we got here the games of the 11th Olympiad well we already had this in our um, what, tutorial so the 11th Olympic Games were recently held in Berlin, Germany, attended by athletes from 49 different nations across the world. The 1936 Summer Olympics are the first in history to have enjoyed limited live television coverage. The Games were a significant propaganda victory for the German regime, which spent lavishly on the event. German athletes saw the most success, winning 33 of the gold medals, while the Americans came in second with 24. Four of these were won by Jesse Owens, the single most successful athlete of the Games. And the Games have concluded, so it doesn't really make an awful lot of difference to us one way or another there. How's our production going? We still have a couple of military factories left. I do have one or two more queued up at the bottom, I think. I'm going to just move them up to the top. And then, of course, just move up the one that's already nearly finished. And then move that one up into second place. We have finished mechanical computing. That is fantastic. That will reduce our research time on other stuff. Um, we don't want to start work on atomic research yet. What about naval doctrine? Could we start working on any of these? So let's assume that we want to keep with fleeting being. So we can have a battle fleet concentration. Increases our search and destroy by 50%. Our organization... Battle cruiser search and destroy by 50%. Heavy cruiser search and destroy by 50%. So basically that's increased, increasing our search and destroy and our organization. This one increases our sub detection and our escort efficiency. And this one increases our submarine surface detection. Now these aren't mutually exclusive so we could pretty much go for all of these. Carrier organization. See, carriers are going to be very, very useful for us, particularly as we are very, very Air Force, Air Force and Navy heavy. So I think we go for Battle Fleet Concentration. And we do have a relatively small coastline to protect. Because we're only going to be really attacked from one direction. I think we just go into Battle Fleet Concentration. Let's go and start working on that. And it'll be very, very useful for taking out German U-boats later, I think. We've got three military factories again. We have uh, only one free. Let's go ahead and put you in on that. So again, it reduces production efficiency. Support equipment is now filled, finally. So how are we going on with those um, divisions? So they have all of their support equipment now, but they are still lacking infantry equipment. By the time they actually get... Um, by the time they actually get all their equipment, we might have enough manpower to get another division or two. In the meantime, of course, we're still leaving our guys um, on manoeuvres. So they are taking a little bit of attrition. Now, I don't think attrition... I'm not too sure the way attrition works. I'm not sure whether it's attritioning the manpower or whether it's actually just attritioning their equipment. Not 100% sure on the way that that works. I haven't looked up attrition. Obviously, in games like uh, Europa Universalis 4, attrition is actually affecting your manpower. So as you take attrition, you lose manpower. You don't actually lose equipment because you don't have equipment. Now, it's only sort of dawned on me last night, but one thing that is majorly different with uh, Hearts of Iron compared to things like EU4 is there's no money involved. You look at Crusader Kings 2, you have gold, you look at um, EU4, you have ducats, you look at Stellaris, you have energy credits... 
you don't have any resource that you spend. Everything is about production. You know, no one's saying, well, you can't get this because you can't afford to do it. The only thing that stops me being able to produce an army is, do I have enough men to make an army? And do I have enough equipment to give them all a gun? And the only thing that stops me producing equipment is, do I have the, the actual material resources? And do I have enough factories to produce the equipment quick enough? It's not a case of not being able to afford it. It's more a case of, can you actually build it in time? And that is something that I do really like about this game. And we've got another factory available. So we'll just keep sticking all of these onto um, infantry equipment. I see the support equipment does keep dropping up and down, but it should sort itself out. Um, oh, no, the world tension just went up slightly there. Uh, it looks like Germany sent two more volunteer divisions to nationalist Spain. How are things going on down there with that at the moment? Um, it does look like Republic and Spain are actually winning the war. They're definitely starting to push their borders back. Don't know how long it's going to take them to reclaim all of their overseas stuff, but certainly their home um, nation seems to be doing okay. And if we zoom out here, yeah, like how as you zoom out, all of your divisions sort of consolidate onto these flags, and as you zoom in, they, uh, they spread out a little bit more. Not too sure... How useful the cavalry is. I wasn't even aware that we used cavalry in World War II. I know we did in, in World War I. Um, and I guess we did use it a bit in the sort of African campaigns. Because sort of the whole Lawrence of Arabia thing. I think that was World War II. I can't even remember now. No, Lawrence of Arabia was World War I. So I don't think if we used, we used that much ca cavalry in World War II. I'm sure there were some theatres of war where we did use the cavalry. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think we were really using cavalry back home. But, uh, yeah, my, my history isn't all that great. So this is the other thing, of course, with Hearts of Iron. And, I, again, I know that I could be playing it at a faster speed. There's two reasons why I'm not. One, I'm waffling on and I don't want the game running at full speed. And, uh, three, it is hitting my frame rate quite heavily. So, I mean, obviously I am recording um, while I am playing. Um, but and I'm still trying to sort of sort out some niggles with recording software at the moment. The problem is, if the game starts to drop frames, I have really bad audio desync issues. And that might not sound like a problem, but when you start doing something like opening and closing a menu, and there's a very audible click. And then when I play that back through Adobe Premiere, what you'll find is I'll open and close the window three or four times, and then two seconds later you'll hear the click. So it really, really winds me up, and I'm doing everything I can to try and avoid that. Um, so that's why I'm not running the game on full, uh, full speed. It's not that my computer can't handle it. It's just that whenever, whenever the game auto-saves or whenever there's some background processing going on, the frame rate dips. And one thing that's particularly affecting it at the moment is the day and night transition, which I think you can actually turn off, but it's still not going to solve the problem completely. But we can now get artillery, so there's some research finish there. I was just having a look here at my logistics... So, what have we got here? This is balance. Daily equipment balance. So, our support equipment, we're actually slightly down. We do have a surplus. So, we've got 106 units of support equipment in storage, but we are down slightly. Um, we do, we have a 2.72 thousand deficit on um, infantry equipment, but we are starting to gain some. Uh, light tanks, we have a surplus of fighters, tactical bombers, convoys. Got a surplus of all of this stuff. Very, very nice. We have a surplus of three units of technical bombers. Fair enough. But we shall pick our next research in the next video. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. I hope you are still enjoying Hearts of Iron 4. I'll see you on the next video. And until then, goodbye for now.